this is three. Here. Three. Thank you, Thank Richard. You. Every screenplay idea comes from a different place. There's, it's, I don't think it's ever happened for me the same way. Once I, I've got a screenplay, I haven't made the film yet, but it, I, I had an incredibly vivid dream and I woke up and, and before I could, and, and it was unusual. Most dreams are so, you know, fragmented and bizarre and David Lynch, David Lynchian. And, uh, and that's a compliment, by the way, for David Lynch. That, uh, um, but this dream was so much, it was so much more complete. So I immediately just, within a few days time, just put it all out there. And it became one of my favorite screenplays because uh, um, it had come uh, from my subconscious or from dreamland or whatever. And you know, that happened, that's only happened once. Another, uh, another time was, was uh, just seeing, it was Brigham City that you referred to. I just was, I was on my way to Los Angeles to make another, to start casting what I thought was going to be my third film. And as I was driving out of, past the gazebo in Mapleton, Utah, where, where we were living at the time, and I was on my, I was about to take a 12 hour drive to Los Angeles. And as I was driving out early morning and the sun was hitting this gazebo and it was such a cinematic, beautiful cinematic shot and I just, started to entertain myself as I was driving, thinking, what kind of movie could I make with that gazebo somehow being a central part of it? And of course, first it starts off being some romance story and a couple dancing on the gazebo. And somehow by the time I got to, to Baker, California, there was a dead body underneath it and a serial killer. And, and I knew I had something. So I actually, I just pulled over. I'd been taking notes as I was driving. Um, and I just eventually pulled over, I believe it was not Baker, must have been Barstow. Yeah, Barstow, by the, when, I realized, when I had the climax of the film, I pulled into a Motel 6 and I just started writing. And then, and then in the morning called the, my casting director and said, hey, we're not making that other film. We're going to make this movie called Brigham City. And then uh, we started casting before I'd even finished the script. So that, you know, that was one of them. And then uh, other times I've just had little sparks of ideas or I've had a, uh, one of my favorite scripts came about because I, my film Falling was screening in Los Angeles and I got a random call from a producer of a, um, a company that media, a big media company that does mostly gay and lesbian films, but he really liked my film. And uh, so he calls me into his office. We have this great, talk and he says hey you, you know you did obviously you did a great film and without a lot of money would you be interested in making a movie for us and I said yeah absolutely and he said do you have anything that you know has maybe some gay or lesbian themes and I said oh yeah absolutely I had no idea <laughs> you know, I was like no but I'm not gonna say that you know so I was like yeah and so this time it was on the way back from LA because I I walked out of the office thinking Oh, but he goes, hey, well, can you have it to us quick? And I said, could I have, you know, I've got something, but it might take me a couple weeks to clean it up. So it's two weeks, okay. And he's like, yeah, that would be great. So then I walk out of his office going, all right, I got two weeks to send this guy a screenplay. And uh, so I get in my car, and that was how that went, because it was like, okay, here's a great opportunity. What can I come up with? And by the time I got back to Salt Lake, I had the idea, and then it, was to take place in southern Utah in the Four Corners kind of area. And so then I drove down there, stayed in the motel and just wrote for seven days and wrote a screenplay. So every, yeah, every, everything comes from a different, and that's the exciting part of it too. And there's an excitement for me knowing, um, it, it took me a long, you know, first off I started just not, as we talked about, you know, just knowing I wanted to, to be a part of this. I wanted to make movies somehow, but I didn't know, I didn't even understand what they were. But I gradually, you know, I started saying, okay, I can act right off the bat. And then I started realizing if I wanted to be an actor and have decent roles, I should start writing. So then I started writing and then I realized, I was in LA realizing all these screenwriters who were actually even making a living at it, but never seeing their movies made. So I realized, well, if I want to see some of my scripts made, I'm gonna to have to produce. And then by that time I was like, well, if I'm producing, 
doing all the work, I'm not going to let somebody else have the fun, so I'm going to direct as well. So I just kind of learned this whole thing. And I think that's, that's somewhat rare, and I didn't appreciate it until fairly recently. But, but realizing, for instance, with, with my film, like Boys at the Bar, which I've just finished, or Brigham City, which, you know, from that initial idea of seeing that gazebo to the time that, you know, seeing the sunlight on the gazebo to the time when the audience were seeing the, the light, you know, flickering on the screen when they were watching the premiere of the film, that was only nine months from that in, initial inspiration to a full audience actually seeing the film and, uh, and realizing, you know, that what a great gift it is to be able to just be walking along the street, taking a morning walk and have an idea and know that if it's the right idea, if it's a good idea, it's just a matter of time before I can take it through the entire process and, and have it and be telling that story to people. Um, it's, it's amazing and it's wonderful. I don't believe in writer's block. I've never had it. I've had laziness. I've had procrastination. I've had fear, but I've never had writer's block and I don't believe in it. I think it's an excuse that, that people use. It's, it's something people created to, uh, because it sounds better than being lazy or procrastinating or being afraid or not having an idea. Uh, so I, I, I don't, I don't have it. And the motivation, the great motivation, uh, there are two motivations for me that drive me as a writer. One of them is when I have one of these fantastic ideas and I just have to get it out. It makes me want to write it. The other motivation is when someone says, we'll pay you for this work. And if you have it done by Friday, you'll, you'll get your check. That's motivating. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Um, so no, I don't, I don't buy into the whole writer's block thing. Is success sustainable in this industry? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And uh, I think success is sustainable. Boy, we could break this question apart so many ways. You know, what, well, how do you define success and blah, blah, blah. If we're talking about financial success, I, I think it's fascinating to watch the ups and downs. And uh, it's, not so much, it's not so fascinating to experience the ups and downs. Uh, the ups are fantastic. The downs are, are, are diff very difficult. Um, but you, you learn in them. And I think it, it, what's fascinating is to watch... And as I'm on the, I had a, at least regionally, I, you know, and, and in the independent world, I had, you know, what would be considered a pretty great amount of success in that limited sphere. Um, and then, you know, struggles afterwards and, re, you know, trying to redefine and, you know, figure out where I wanted to go next. Um, and I watch, you know, especially, you, I mean, it happens. You, you, we're not really conscious of it mostly as consumers. We see, oh, here's this guy who just directed this great film. We're not even thinking about where he was five years ago. And five years later, we're not thinking about him anymore. He comes back 10 years later and he's got another film. You just think, oh, he's a filmmaker. You don't know what happened, how he survived in the meantime. Writers the same way or even harder and producers. I mean, the whole, everybody. But we see it more with actors, you know, you see, you see, you know, these people who have amazing success and then you see them down and so many of them never come back up. And, um, and I think it would be fascinating to, uh, most people when they, when they meet famous people, just want to get their selfies and they want to, you know, they want to get a selfie so they can post it on Facebook or they just want to tell them how much they, you know, to me, when I meet somebody who's been around the block in the business, I want to talk about this question. How did not, not, I just like, you know, how do you, you know, with your perspective now, especially someone who's hit the bottom, come back up. It's like looking back on that, what would you tell your younger self? What would you tell all the other people who are, who are in the, in the position that, that you were, you know, what, what do they need to know? There's so much there, you know, there's so, so much there. And uh, for me, I'm going to answer the question as like, if I could talk to myself, myself of 12 years ago, 
I mean, uh, 15 years ago, what would I tell myself? I would tell myself, don't put your money into movies. Because <laughs> that, was, that was, you know, the classic stupid mistake. I made a lot of money, and I immediately was, like, excited. This is going to last forever. I did it. I created Mormon cinema. We're going to make all these great movies. I'm going to just put my own money into the movies. That's the first thing I'd say. Richard, I don't, don't do that, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, being financially smart is probably, I think that's the one thing, I, I, trying to, you, it's hard to talk to somebody who's at the top, though, because they think it's going to, you know, they think this is going to last, you know, and I'm finally being rewarded for all of my hard work, and, and this is, you know, they, it's hard for them to imagine that five years, they could be, they could be back where they were, or worse, um, and, uh, so appreciating the success when it comes and understanding that it's not going to last. It's not going to last for anybody. I mean, for anybody. I think about, you know, Mickey Rooney was the most famous, one of the most, you know, most successful actors of his generation. This was long before me, you know, and by the time, you know, I was... In my 20s, Mickey Rooney, who? And, you know, he'd take whatever job he could get. And um, same thing with directors, same thing with writers, same thing with producers. So, uh, yeah, well, we, we could talk for a long time about this, about what, you know, how you, how you do it. But, but one thing I think is important is to, is to always remember why you're in the business. It's like what we spoke about a few minutes ago you know if you're um, if you're in it for for the fame for the money for the sex for the power I, and I, I was talking one of the things a guy I talked to in, in Los Angeles one time we're sitting down and he asked me he's like why are you why are you doing this and I said oh because I I love movies I love cinema I want to tell I want to be a part of telling stories um, cinematically and I asked him why why he was working at one of the agencies I said why are you uh, here, and he says, "I want to be powerful." And it, there was no iron, there was no sarcasm, there was no humor. He was dead serious. I want to be powerful, and that really had an, made an impression on me. And I started to see that a lot of the people who that I was associating with, that I was that I was rising with, some of we're all, or at least we're all trying to rise together. Um, that was it, and. Uh, and I'm telling that's not enough. I don't think that's, I don't think those motivations are going to last. You know, I think, I mean, after a while, the fame, the power, the money, the sex, none of it's, none of it's going to carry you through. Um, and so maybe that's the secret of, of who's still around 40 years later, you know, the people who hit it in their 20s or 30s. Who's still around in their 70s, 80s? It's the people who love the art. It's they love the craft. They love cinema. Um, those are the people, I think that's the motivation. The love of it is the only thing that's going to keep you going through all the hard times. And there's hard, hard times. That, you know, that, that's something I've never really spoken about. But it's something that I am very, I've become very, aware of, which is, we spoke briefly about when I fell in love with, with movies, with cinema when I was six, seven years old, and how I just, I never, I never seriously considered doing anything else. It's just what I always, and I had to figure it out. I had to figure out how to do it. I had to, I was, you know, I'd see movies, I'd buy books on independent filmmaking. I just tried to figure out, you know, how to do it until I, I made it happen to a degree, and I'm still trying to make it happen to greater degrees. But, you know, the whole time there have been people who try, who've been trying to talk me out of it. The whole time, you know. Um, whether I was an actor, you know, I wasn't good looking enough, and whether, and then I'd see Dustin Hoffman, and I was just, you don't have to be good looking, you can just be good, you know. Writer, you know, you're not, you're not, you know, you're not the best writer. It's like, well, I'll, I'll become the best writer. I'm going to learn, you know. It's not something that, that's the other thing, that people have this, that there's this strange idea that you're just born a great director or you're born a great 
you know, actor, it, it's a craft. I mean, sure, there's there's some innate talent, but a lot of it is craft. It's learning. It's you gotta, you know, you've got to. It's just like any kind of. Uh, it's like learning how to make beautiful stained glass windows or sculptures. It's like you, you don't just walk up to a piece of rock and create this beautiful masterpiece. It's like you may, you may have something in your mind that you want to do, but it, it takes years of work, mistakes, you know, and, um, and mentorship to become, you know, to, to get to that point. So, uh, um, so always people, you know, everyone's always trying to talk to you about it. When I got to college, I remember, you know, to me, I was, I was very single-minded. It was like, I'm doing this, you know, I'm doing, this is what I'm doing, and I'll do other things. You know, I'll work at 7-Eleven all night so that I can keep going to school so I can learn, and guess what? College doesn't teach you how to make films. That's something else we could talk about. <laughs> I'm not sure I'd recommend, you know, university education if you want to be a filmmaker. Um, if you want to teach film, great, go do it. But... But even, even in college, I noticed that, uh, you know, I, I'd have these friends who wanted to be filmmakers. And I had another, another conversation that will always stick with me. I think it was a 4th of July per, uh, thing here in, down in Utah Valley, sitting on the lawn talking with this guy who was about to get married, and he, he wanted to be a filmmaker. And, and so I was asking him, are you going to L.A.? We're going to graduate soon. Are we going to Los Angeles? And... And he's like, no, I think, you know, I can't remember the woman's name. We'll just call her Mary, you know. You know, Mary's not too hot about me being a filmmaker, so, you know, I think I'll go into teaching. Or And I was shocked. I was absolutely shocked. I was like, wait a minute. You, you, you wanted to make films, and you meet this woman, and now you don't want to make films before because you... And, and it became clear to me that he didn't want it enough. You know, there's kind of a, a thinning process that goes along. Same thing in Los Angeles. People, it's hard, so they give up. And, and um, um, but it doesn't stop. It never stops. Um, and uh, this is somewhat personal, but I'll talk about it because it's important. So my married, I'm not married any longer. And one of the breaking points for my relationship with my wife and the woman that I love, I still love her very much. And, and, uh, you know, we spent 23 years together. And she was there at the beginning when we got married. I said, look, I'm, I'm a filmmaker. This is what I'm going to do. We're not going to have money. We're going to Los Angeles. It's going to be hard. And she got it. She's like, yeah, yeah, let's, I'm, I'm up for that. You know, and she believed in, she believed in me. And, um, and she put in so much. I mean, she was, you know, in Los Angeles, it was hard. You know, I was, I was managing apartments. She was working an advertising job. You know, I, and we went through times where we had hardly any money at all. In fact, a lot of times we had no money um, for a very, you know, very long time. And it was very difficult. But she kept, she kept working. We kept risking everything. And then we risked everything to make my first film, uh, Girl Crazy. And, you know, making a, making a full-length film for, I think I had $14,000 to try to get it in the can. And she put in so much time. And then it was somewhat successful over a long process. It took about five years to get that made. Finally sold it to HBO, but not enough to make the money back. So then I was trying to make God's Army because I had this idea more that she bought into that, right? After, after the success of that and things went well and then everything else went to hell. Um, of course, there were many factors. This isn't the primary factor, but... One of the breaking points was, this was after, after States of Grace hadn't done very well, Falling wasn't, you know, wasn't doing well, the economy went to hell, and my investors fled, and I lost, um, I lost my religious faith, and when I did that, I lost almost all of my financial support, uh, I lost most of my audience. Life suddenly became very difficult again, and I'd been... Uh, totally cheated on a couple of big business deals. Uh, something else I learned in, in Hollywood dealing with these companies, foreign com foreign sales company, uh, just constantly, people are constantly ripping you off, no matter how careful you are to, to keep it from happening. So uh, after several of these disappointments, and, and she said, why don't you just stop? You know, just stop. Just do something else. Just 
And I, I said, I can't. It, it was unfathomable to me to say, well, I can't do that. I mean, what, you want me to just stop making films? And she's like, yes, look at this business. Look at these people. She, I mean, she was front row seats for all the, all the awful, you know, dishonesty and corruption and, and how difficult it is. Even if you succeed, that's what she said. She goes, look, you, you know, in any other business, no one can be at your level or be doing it as well as you are and be struggling to, you know, pay the mortgage and be struggling to take care of a family. It's like, this is ridiculous. It's a, it's a stupid business. It's time to stop. And I, just, I couldn't do it. You know, it's like, no, there's another way. I'm going to figure it out. There's something else because this is, I don't, and maybe it's stupidity, stubbornness, but it's, but it's what I love. This is what I, you know, it's, and you don't, you don't walk away from, from that. You can't walk away from that because that's the day that you start to die. Okay, this is becoming way too philosophical, no. but, <laughs> but, uh, but this is, but this is why I do it. You know, it's like why I, and I, I struggle with that a lot. You know, it's a, it's a fight every day waking up thinking, how do I how do I keep doing this? How do I how do I keep serving this? It, it is it is like a um, Coppola is always talking about filmmaking as like a mistress or whatever. That's not the word I would use, but but it is a love. I mean, it's something that you the, um, that you just don't walk away from, you know. Film school. Um, I had a, I came from a very blue collar family, and nobody had ever gone to college before me. We were, my family was, you know, bartenders, truck drivers, uh, bricklayers, and uh, and so, to me, as I as I knew I wanted to make films, but I also had this idea that. You know, I wanted to go to a university. I wanted to, you know, I wanted to be an educated person. And it seemed like you want to learn how to, you know, there were universities that had film programs, so it just made sense to me that that's how you'd go learn to make a film. Um, when I got to the university, I was very, uh, it, and it was, it was, it doesn't make sense because one of the, I thought going to the university, this is where I'm going to learn the important things about life. I'm going to learn how to live, how to be a man, how to live, um, wisely how to you know and I think maybe I had too philosophical of an idea about what a university is but I uh, I, I, I soon found that university wasn't that it seemed to me I, I was a little bit disillusioned because it seemed like the university was just a job job training program it's like all they're trying to do is teach you one little thing and get you ready to go into the workforce. I was looking more towards, uh, you know, I wanted to know the meaning of life and, you know, the purpose of it all and, and a great, you know, and I found out that's not, you know, that's from silly English novels that I must have read. I had that idea. Um, but then, oddly, that wasn't true in the film program. They didn't teach you how to go be a, they weren't training you to be a filmmaker. I mean, everywhere else they were training you to be a chemist you know, they're training you to be a lawyer, they're, but not the film program. The film program, and, and now it makes sense. Now, of course, looking back on it, I, it's like, it's be, you know, film programs are, with very rare exceptions, are designed, run, and taught by people who've never been in the professional filmmaking world. And all they're teaching is film theory, they're teaching uh, film history, they're, they're teaching, even the, even the practical production it's still film theory because it's all theoretical because they haven't done it. You know, there's not their, you know, their, their careers have never been on the line. So I learned that I was about two years into my film degree when I realized that I wasn't learning. I wanted to leave and be able to go immediately make an independent film, a full length independent film. And I realized that I couldn't do it. You know, that I wouldn't be able to do it. I went to the head of the film program and I said, Hey, this is what's happening. I'm thinking of leaving because I'm not learning. I want to leave 
when I get my diploma, I want to walk out the door and be ready to go make a film. And he's like, you will, don't worry about it. You'll, you can do this. And, um, and so I trusted him and it was ridiculous. I was, I was like five months from getting my degree and I realized that I didn't know how to do it. I could tell you all about, you know, Frank Capra and the, you know, Lumiere brothers and all the history of film and film theory and, and genre film, but I didn't know how to make one. I didn't know how to raise money. I didn't know how to, you know, incorporate. I didn't know how to make a company. I didn't know how to, you know, hire people. I didn't know the process of making a film, how the physical processes of it. And so I, even though it wasn't required for my degree at that point, I was like, I've got to take advantage of this while I've got it. So I went out and I, I from other books that I couldn't get at the university, I was learning how to raise money, create a little company. And I did. I raised three thousand thirty five hundred dollars made a short film that I thought maybe I could sell. So I created a company and then I did the whole thing, you know, wrote and directed and edited and then finished it myself. So the, when I finally graduated, it was completely, I could have graduated without having had that experience at all, but I wouldn't have known anything. But that film, that 10 minute film that I made was what taught me how to make films. And then I went out and I thought, okay, now, now that I'm, you know, what's a feature length film except nine of these strung together, you know? And if I can do one of those, I could do nine of those. And so that's, and I, and I knew, I understood the process. And at that point, my, but my first film, Girl Crazy, the, the first feature length film, that was film school. That was everything, you know? And uh, I look back on, on film school at the university and I'm grateful for it because of, uh, of exposing me to some of the great filmmakers that I never would have seen otherwise. Um, that's where I discovered, you know, Bergman. That's where I first saw a couple of very influential films for me, which was uh, The Bicycle Thief, Vittorio De Sica's Bicycle Thief, and um, The Blue Angel. Those two films were very... Uh, influential for me because that's when having grown up very much just a regular American boy you know I was used to just Hollywood movies and that experience of seeing those two movies I saw them very close together and realizing that movies could be so much more and uh, realizing that that's what I wanted to do and that um, that so so for that reason yeah but is it necessary no absolutely not you know I tell people I say if you don't have money for film school or you don't want to go to film school or you don't have the grades, who cares? In fact, you might not want to go anyway. If you really know you want to do this, just, you know, watch, watch the great films, you know, watch a course, watch, you can get more, you can get more instruction in filmmaking from watching Scorsese's Goodfellas five times than most people get out of an entire university. You, watch, watch Goodfellas, you know, watch it then watch it again, and then watch it with the sound turned off, and you're just watching what he does with the camera, you know, and then just listen to it, you know, and go pick, you know, go pick up some other movies, some uh, Walter Murch movies that the sound, the editor, sound designer, uh, Walter Murch, just listen to his movies, and so you can get so much more just from, uh, uh, just from that, and then make your own film, and that's where you're going to make all the mistakes, and uh, don't expect your first film to be good. Don't expect your second film to be good. But get through the process. And uh, if you do that, yeah. And and you know I've got a I've got my degree in film, and um, I don't think it it's never done me. The only good it's ever done me is when I was in Los Angeles trying to stay alive. Is I was able to substitute teach at the LA Unified School District because I had a degree. Other than that. No one's ever in a film related, no one's ever said, what, where did you go to school? I mean, they might just out of curiosity, but not, you know, it's like, hmm, we're thinking about hiring you to write the screenplay. Where did you, uh, you know, do you have a film degree? No one's ever, nobody gives a damn, you know, doesn't matter. All that matters is, are you, do you have the craft? You know, do you have the skill? Um, can you do the job? You don't have to go to school for that.